data science group. Okay, thanks, Adam, and welcome, everyone. I think the the wine is a great motivator for asking questions. I I would like to be in the audience for that. So uh, yes, yeah, so welcome. So I'm Zoltan Toth, and now I have kind of a double hat here. One is that I represent the Vienna Data Science Group, so I'm part of the organization of this uh, webinar event. And you know, uh, if you were here last time, it was Alex. Uh, from Barcelona, he's also an organizer who delivered the talk. But you know, guys, we we don't want to deliver talks all the time. So please reach out if you if you want to deliver a talk to keep this uh, keep this going. So, and I also my other hat is uh, now as uh, um, as a CDO of DataPow, which is a a company I will tell a few words later who sponsored uh, this uh, this talk. By I me, mean, uh, I could prepare in my work time. So um, we only have right 25 minutes and it's kind of a broad topic. So let me just share my screen and really just jump right into it. So here we are. OK. So uh, one word about uh, the sponsor of Data Power, and but this also comes with a bias warning. So not just a pure pitch, uh, we are uh, Data Respire Cloud uh, services and training uh, company. So if you're interested in uh, in any of these services or trainings when it comes to Azure or Data Resource Spark or AWS for that, then uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, I will leave my uh, my email and LinkedIn later. Also, this comes with a bias. The bias means that most of the work we are doing, we are either doing it through Databricks, which is a which is a data science platform, uh, and in the cloud with AWS or uh, mostly Azure nowadays. And we work a lot with online and manufacturing companies. So the use cases that I saw are, are mostly from, from, from these. But the general, all the general conclusions, I think, uh, work pretty well so far. So yeah, let's see. So that's about it. And let's get down to the technical details so we, uh, we can talk as much as possible. Uh, that's why I'm also rushing with my voice. So uh, managing the machine learning lifecycle is, is nothing new, really. Uh, even if you take a look at the CRISP standard, that, that got introduced as a standard in 1996. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this model, how businesses work. And this is still how you work. Uh, you have your some business understanding. You use your data uh, to understand what's going on. You do some data preparation modeling and then model evaluation and deployment. So this is the CRIP standard. Uh, you can check it out on Wikipedia. At the end of this webinar, you will get access to the uh, to the Wikipedia uh, to the to the slides that that are presented here. So you can just go and check it out for for yourself too. Now here is another one, and uh, I like this somewhat better. This is a, from a friend. Uh, who runs the uh, Los Angeles Data Science Group, uh, Silar Pafka. And um, he does pretty much the same, but perhaps more practical. So what he says is, uh, is that you have some raw data, or you know you have some data warehouse uh, for that sake. You somehow convert it to feature engineering to, to uh, machine learning data. You do some modeling. You evaluate the model. You, you make conclusions. And once you're satisfied, or once the deadline is over for that, you, you you get to kind of jump the wall and deploy. And this wall is here because very much uh, many times it represents the uh, the wall between data scientists and data engineers, which is perhaps not the best practice to, to keep that separated. But you somehow put it then to the engineering world, and you start scoring. You start predicting with your model, right? It can be real time, or it can be batch based on live data, and then you check out what's going on. Uh, you probably also go and just uh, monitor uh, your uh, your model. And well, most of the cases, let's not be too romantic, you want to make more money, right? So that's what you're aiming at, even though everyone is loud by changing the world. But yeah, that's the end result, unless you, you are in probably non-profit healthcare or some some lucky places where you really make it better, perhaps. So 
Um, this is really uh, a life cycle. And then, of course, by this, you learn, you improve, and you just do this again. Now, this is what we want to uh, take a look at here on a very, very high level uh, hands on overview. If you're interested in, in this concept, you can check out this YouTube video, which is a meetup talk from Sillard. Uh, he goes through this in, in like an hour and a half. It's a very, very clear explanations. And he has a, really a lot of experience from the data science side. Um, also, disclaimer here I'm not a data scientist. I used to be like 10 years ago, but uh, I'm doing data engineering uh, since. So, uh, also, if you're interested in some more details, there is also a GitHub link. Okay. So let's see what else we have here. This is what we are going to focus in the next 20 minutes or so. We have our model you can, and how we can track our models and evaluate our models and how we can give some uh, lifecycle management to our models for deployment. So how we can have a model registry and just pick the models for deployment. This is what I want to show you real quick. And of course, there are many other tools also, for example, for monitoring models, for detective, uh, detecting statistical drifts or any, any problems in the world. But uh, as we are short on time, we will focus on the, uh, the first two. For this, we are going to use this uh, tool called MLflow. And MLflow is an open source, uh, it's an open source platform. It, uh, what it gives you, it's a software after all, right? It's a service, and it helps you track uh, machine learning experiments. So perhaps if you are into machine learning, then you you know the problem that you're doing your modeling, you get to some good models, but then you're changing parameters. And I'm not talking about uh, parameter tuning through grid search or whatever, but when you're really exploring your model, you're changing some parameters, doing this and that, and and um, and you just forget what uh, what what you had like two hours ago, which was you know perhaps not that good in that respect, but another one in another. So you want to track your models. Also, it can easily happen that uh, as your model evolves, this also happened uh, with us with an, an automotive uh, manufacturing use case that we had some model that had some special predictions that we. Uh, that we didn't like, but it, it didn't seem to be important at that day. So we just moved on and did, did our developments and so on. And then a few days later, it was like, oh man, we, we need those best predictions. So what we, we need to analyze the model. What went wrong, wrong there? So how can we get back and, and check previous versions of these models? So that's also uh, a problem that MFO tackles. So you can track your models and you can. Um, you can just go and register them, put it in a model registry, and and make sure that you see it has versioning, and you see that it is like a staging model, it's ready to be uh, productionized or or anything like that. So this is tracking and the models and the model registry, and also MFLow has another piece uh, which we are not going to cover now. It's about how to uh, package models in a way that you can just pass it over to your fellow data scientist, and, and she has all the environment and all the input parameters and all the code in a standardized way. And she can execute it in a standardized way and, and investigate it in a standardized way. So that's really MLflow. Uh, it is at mlflow.org, the project. And uh, feel free to check it out. Quite easy to install. We also set up an MLflow server for you. This will be in the notebook um, sharing with you. This is mflow.datapower.com. So if you don't want to struggle with uh, setting up uh, or the, the MLflow server, this is a free server, free on a way that it is, doesn't have any authentication. So after the webinar, you can just go set this as a tracking server for any MLflow app and just start tracking, start using the model registry. That's, that's here for you for free. OK, so check it out later, and feel free to break it. Uh, so yeah, going back here, uh, one last thing is that 
everything uh, I'm showing here, the notebook itself, it will be available for you after uh, after this demo. Make sure you download this presentation and you have all the link on how to you know create an environment, download the notebook I'm showing, and uh, and get started. So it should be there, and the data and everything will be there. So you should be able to reproduce it at home. Also, here we are using uh, Azure Databricks. So on the Azure cloud, this service called Databricks, which is a notebook environment, it's backed by Apache Spark, and it has a very good MLflow integration. But you can re replicate this whole demo on-prem with uh, which, uh, with pure open source and not managed tools like you know the Jupyter notebook or or uh, anti open source uh, MLflow. I I give some guidance about it in the notebook. So if you want to go full on prem, uh, that's cool. But there is also uh, free versions here that you can use in managed environment. Okay, so let's see. So here is my demo notebook. So that will be the Azure Databricks environment. Let's give it a minute. All right. So what we are doing is um, we set up a light GBM model. A light GBM is an open source gradient boosted tree implementation. If you're not familiar with gradient boosted trees or light GBM, it's just a machine learning algorithm, uh, which is a, it's just a pretty modern high performing machine learning algorithm. We will tune this light GBM model a bit, create an MLflow experiment. You will see how you can uh, track it on the UI. Then we will yeah, do the tracking, register it to the MLflow model registry, and get it ready uh, for to be tagged as a production model. And then uh, just really just downloading this model and making a prediction. So we have approximately 20 minutes for that. So it will be uh, a bit of a rush, uh, but hopefully you will be able to follow here. If you want to uh, recreate this at home, here are all the uh, all the instructions for that. If you have any other questions, uh, you know, really just just about uh, anything about this notebook, I'm happy to to answer LinkedIn emails or or if you just drop us uh, an email, that uh, that's cool too. Cool. Okay. So here is really where everything is starting. Let me execute this cell to make sure it. All works. So, uh, what are we doing? We are reading a Parquet file. A Parquet is like a CSV, but uh, but it's a, a very uh, modern format. If you don't know what a Parquet is, then it's even more important than MLflow to to go and convert all your CSVs to Parquet because everything will be 10x faster then. So, we are reading a Parquet file, and this Parquet file is from a uh, from a power plant. It's data from a power plant. What you see here is uh, this is so this is Spark code. We are reading it from from a data source, and we are just making some replacement of the actual columns. So this is the this is our file. There is an outside temperature. There is uh, the steam speed of the uh, of the power plant. There is also atmospheric pressure. There is some humidity, and what we want to predict is power emission. What will be the exact power emission? Uh, from the power plant. This is uh, real data from a power plant in Istanbul. And I give you I give you some references in the notebook about how you can fetch this data. So you see temperature, power emission, all these. Let's go and build the model, OK? So uh, we will simply go and set up a, a Spark machine learning pipeline. It means, whoops, sorry. Uh, I will need to execute this cell. I thought I executed it already. So this cell is just for the import side. I don't want to really show this. OK, here we go. So for this, we are building a pipeline. We are assembling all our feature vectors, so everything which is not a power emission, into a column called features. And then we are having a light GBM a gradient boosted tree on it. This we will call the pipeline. And what I want you to remember is that we have a model, uh, an object a variable called LightGBM. This is what we will do. So we have a pipeline. Let's go and just make a random split. 
uh, train this pipeline on the train and transform this pipeline on the test. Okay, very basic machine learning and just display the predictions data frame. So this is just very simple pipe machine, uh, Spark machine learning code, um, but you don't need to use Spark for using MLflow. I just use it because that's my uh, choice here. So we have temperature, vacuum, speed, pressure, humidity, power emission, and the feature vector. This is sparse representation. I oh, know that's actually dense. It doesn't matter. And the prediction. So here is the prediction. Let's go and uh, check out this model in, in detail and just track it. We care about here uh, two metrics. Uh, you probably are familiar with that. If not, don't worry about that. One is the root mean squared error. The other one is the R squared. We want to have as low root mean squared error as possible and as, as high R squared close to one uh, as possible in the chase of our perfect model. So here you see our root mean squared error is approximately three. So let's try to improve it. Okay, so let's take a look how you can do this with MLflow. If you want to use MLflow in an on-prem environment, or use the server uh, I created. You can just uncomment this at home and use the server. Here, because MLflow is integrated with, uh, with the Databricks platform, we will simply just set up a local experiment here. So I will just say, hey, MLflow, my experiment should be the webinar experiment. And if I go to my home, I will see that there is actually a webinar experiment experience coming up. OK, so that will be the MLflow service. Let me open this uh, in a new tab. This one, and this. So this is MLflow. This is really how it looks. This is the open source version embedded, uh, and you see there is nothing here, no experiment, nothing. So let's run a few experiments. Let me uh, come back to my. Uh, to, to my screen. So we will say, hey, MFLOW, we need to do a new run. Now, there are two concepts. The experiment is the actual problem we are tackling, and the run is one try, so one model training, for example. So we say, just train the GBM with default parameters. So we are retraining, retransforming, and predicting. And what you can do with the MLflow tracking API is four things. One, you can log parameters like you know hyperparameters of your model, like number of uh, leaves or max depth of a light GBM. Uh, you can log a metric like how well your power model performed, like uh, RMSC and R squared. Hey, I hear, here I have an error. This should be R squared. And um, also you can log an artifact, so any image or any file that you create. Or you can also log your model. So the model itself, you can set. So let's go and execute this. OK. So we are retraining our model now and just logging it to MLflow. Cool. And now if I go and refresh my MLflow UI, I should be able to already see a single run. OK, there you go, right? There is a run in this experiment. You see that the mox depth, which is the default, is minus one. Number of leaves is default. Here is the I square. Here is the RMSE. If you want to investigate it more, you just click it. Here are all the metrics. And well, nothing too much here, right? Like no files log, no, no other model log, nothing like that. So that's like a super simple use case for now. But let's just go on and, uh, and log more. So I can say, OK. Now set the maximum depth of the trees in this light GBM ensemble to three. So regulate this model somehow. And I just log a parametric, so multiple parameters. You can also do that with them. So here we are logging not just the max depth, but also alpha and the number of uh, trees. OK, so you see that this max depth three, it, it wasn't a good idea, really. RMS is pretty high. So let's move on. So let me just create a more manual run. A more manual run means that I'm not doing this read MLflow the start run, 
because that will conclude the run automatically after the block. But I'm just saying, just start the run and leave it open. And let's set back the max def to minus one and increase the number of leaves to 50. And just train this model and log the same things. Okay, so this is running. You see, this looks much better now. Uh, when we take a look at our MSC. Okay, so we can conclude. I mean, you can imagine you are doing this. You are your training models, your tracking models, and uh, let me come back. And here now you have multiple runs. <coughs> so you see that we have two finished runs, right? And one which doesn't have this check, it is still running. But I can still come and just try to compare these, for example. I can say compare these runs. Here you see that the, uh, here are the different number of leaves, right? Here are the different max death. So you just see that. And also you can take a, a check out the plot. So you can say, hey, I'm actually interested in how the number of leaves uh, determines root mean squared error. And then here you say that, OK, I had two experiments with number of leaves with a small value with a varying RMSE. And then we also have a high number of leaves with a low value. You can also say, hey, what's the difference here? Then you can go to a contour plot, for example, where you can say, OK, so let's check the max depth versus number of leaves and check out the RMSC. And here, well, what you would say, uh, I wouldn't say that's the most expressive plot, but still helps, is that if you want to go to a lower RMSC, you get to find it here on the top uh, top left, right? So number of leaves a lot, and walk step really uh, low. So this is really how then you can go and just compare uh, your models. So that's the tracking UI really in a nutshell. It has many other features like uh, nested runs. And if you work with, let's say, uh, in a, with an early stopping algorithm, you can also see how your, your metric descends. There are other uh, charts for that. But for this simple demo, that's really the main point, what you saw here. So I can say, OK, this model is good. So let's just save my model. Let me go and just save my model with MLflow log model. I log it in a Spark format. There are many other model formats MLflow supports. And there is some there, there is a lot of constraints and tricks with that. If you if you guys are joining the, the Zoom call after this quick demo, then I'm happy to explain. But here we're just saying we work with a Spark model, so just log it in a Spark model format. And now this run is ended with a finished status, which means we are good. It's not, not fair that it's ended. OK, and of course, everything we do here, you can do through the API, too. So if you're interested in the runs, I can just say, hey, search for runs. Here are my three runs right? with all the attributes. But let's just go to the UI and uh, take a look at our last run where we saved the model. So let's take a look what you can do with a model. So I think the last one was with the lowest RMSE, so this one in the first. And if I take a look, here you see it. There is an artifact, right? So that's uh, that's my model. And you I saved it by the name Spark Model, if you remember, there. So I saved it as Spark Model. And I will say, hey, what is my Spark Model? What you see here is a bunch of files. This is the MLflow standard format. It has the model itself. It has some model description. Uh, and it has an environment. An environment you can you can also customize, but by default it gives you a content environment. What Python environment you need to uh, to execute this model? Here you see everything is Python, but actually with MLflow you can go with Java and R and Python, and in some cases it really gives you a um, a bridge between technologies. So for example, you can train an XGBoost model uh, or an MLEAP model, for example, or something that, that MLEAP can handle in Python, and then you can make a prediction in, in Scala. So you can just uh, bridge these. This, this is a great feature, but again, we can talk about it later after the webinar. So coming back here, this is my Spark model. 
I like it, so I say, okay, let's just register this model right here. So let's register this model, and my model will be demo model. How about I create new model? Create new model, demo model. Okay, so it says the registration is pending. So now it uses the MFLOW model registry and just puts your model there. So let me open the model registry. And here you will see, okay, here is a demo model. This is the first version. If you really don't like it, you can just go and delete it, or you can productionize it somehow. These are very simple features, but keep in mind the MFLOW model registry is a very new feature. It's still some experimental edges there. But what you can say is that now I have a model. OK, so let me just go now out of Spark to a standard Python application. So here is a standard Python application which uses, which uses the MFLOW UI for getting my model. It uses the MFLOW client, connects to, to MFLOW. So forget about it that we are in a Spark notebook. We are not using anything Spark specific now. We just say, hey, what are my, our registered models? And you can just use the API to work with the models. The, the ground is really that it's so simple. It's just model registry is just a registry. So I can say, hey, I want to now get some production models. So get the registered models and just pick a model which is flagged as production. And it will say, hey, no models are flagged as production. Yet. So let me just go and productionize my model. So I can say, stage uh, transited to production. And I can comment. So this is a good model. Deploy that. So I can say that. And then you know the data engineering might come and take a look and say, no, not this guy again. So computer says no. OK, you get the point. I'm not doing to do that because every minute matters. So I will just go and approve. Uh, MFL at the moment doesn't have any sophisticated uh, authenticator authorization, but you know it's in an early phase. So I can just approve. Computer says yes. And now it is deployed. So I'm coming back. And let's see if we have any models in production. There we go. We have a model in production, and I have the path for it because uh, MFLOW just told me. So I just got the list of all the models in production and just got the actual uh, path for the last version. OK, so from this point, I can say, hey, MFLOW, load this model. Keep in mind that we trained this model in Spark, but now we just say, I want the prediction function now. And MFLOW will create a prediction function without Spark, so no Spark cluster needed. And I can create a few features now with a pandas data frame because, again, I'm not in Spark. And I just say, OK, here is my pandas data frame. And take this function and just predict. So pass this data frame and just make a prediction. And there you go. Here are the two predictions there. OK, so that's really it. So it has a tracking UI, and it has a model registry, and different other components. And the time is up. So this is actually the end of the, uh, the demo as planned. So if you're interested, stay for the Q&A, and then later for the Zoom call when we have more time. And uh, check this out at home by downloading the slides that we are sharing with you. Thank you, Zoltan, and thanks everyone who already uh, sent uh, their questions. We are still open uh, for questions. And uh, you know what? I think that was it. We decided to do this close up thing because we have, I would say, um, two, three groups of questions. Uh, first group is about uh, technically, so how to use flow technically, how it works with other tools, with other. Um, uh, data and then we have a set of questions which are about uh, comparing uh, them uh, with the other tools and uh, uh, maybe listing the pros and cons and uh, um, probably I won't cover the technical questions and uh, those guys can uh, still join us at the close up and I think this is something that 
Zoltan uh, can show in real time, and I think that makes more sense. Um, so, okay, first question from uh, Dr. Viharos. Uh, Dr. Viharos, if uh, I mean something else, just feel free to comment it in the chat uh, while asking it. So, uh, the question is, what are the situations describing the point when a learning model cannot be applied anymore and have to build a complete new one? Uh, can, can you come again, Adar? I missed the second part. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, what are the features and situations describing the point when a learning model cannot be applied anymore and we have to build a complete new one? So that was a question at the very beginning. Oh, it, um, yeah, there are there are many of these situations, but once again, the disclaimer, I'm not a data scientist, but for what we saw in our use cases is, uh, well, one is uh, if you just Google data drift, you will see how, how that works. So in IoT situations, so in manufacturing, it can uh, it can many times happen, for example, that that someone just changes some measurements or, or some sensor, and your predictions are going completely completely wrong. So you either need to retrain, if you can retrain very easily, or just tune your features. Also another, uh, another use case could be, for example, fraud detection, when you're detecting fraud and you're getting, let's say in a credit card situation, you're getting very good with fraud detection, and then the, the actual fraudsters will develop new algorithms which you're not catching because your model is trained to, to certain patterns. So in these cases, uh, you, you should retain your, your scenario, um, your machine learning model. But I'm sure there is several more. Uh, check out this concept of data drift. Uh, there is already a starting like science about what are these use cases. Okay, we have another question. It's a very good question from Samuel uh, Maguire. Uh, what are the advantages of MLflow over something like a Docker or a similar tools? Um, there is a, uh, like Samuel supposes that is more focused on machine learning and not uh, quite generic uh, as Docker. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So, uh, you know, you can still use Docker and pull your model from MLflow or in your CI CD pipeline, just, just pull the fresh model from MLflow and compile a Docker based on that. Uh, so, so they are really not exclusive. They are they they can go hands in hand. So MFLow only solves the machine learning tracking and registry uh, function for you. It also does some serving actually, so it can set up a serving server. But uh, yeah, it's not exclusive with Docker. You should use it with Docker if you uh, if that's the stack that you are comfortable with. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, we have a question from uh, Marco. What would you say as uh, what, what is the main advantage of MLflow with respect to uh, DVC data versioning control? The, so the main the main advantage is really that you can go and just uh, log multiple versions of your. I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but you can you can log multiple versions of uh, of your model. So one use case I can give you. This is what I mentioned is that if you go and you you retrain your model and just go and and uh, log all the versions and you can go back to previous versions then for example in a high risk huge scenario when you you remember that there were some predictions you want to understand more but you're already improved on your model you can just go back and uh, and, and and check out and analyze it better so it's yeah it's kind of version control for more so you can just go back and, and and check earlier versions if things are going wrong or if you want to take a look okay next question from Noe Casas uh, do data scientists uh, and machine learning engineers use MLflow when creating a model uh, for example uh, try different algorithms uh, quick iterations play with the hyperparameters or is it more uh, suited to uh, archiving models um, that have already been tested and worked well? So basically deploying in production. So you're not data science, but you work with, with the data science, so I'm quite sure you know. Yeah, so, so uh, definitely where MLflow is strongest is, is uh, doing your model exploration. So, so tracking your models as you are, uh, as you are re researching your models and tuning your models and, and tracking 
what model versions you had, or how they differ, and uh, just have a feel about what, what's the best model, what are the trade-offs. So I think this is really the main point. Uh, and this is the point the MFLOW project originally uh, attacked. And now, uh, now in the latest releases, we are shifting more toward the deployment uh, topic. Okay, and um, then the, we have a question. What could you say uh, about MLflow uh, comparing or maybe um, enriching each other with the TensorFlow board? Uh, I don't have any experience with the TensorFlow board, unfortunately. I mean, I, I saw it uh, running, but I, I uh, haven't done any projects with uh, TensorFlow board. So I don't know how, you, how they compare, but uh, so don't quote me on that, but I think they have some similar features. So, uh, with TensorFlow, you can uh, pretty easily uh, go and in integrate MLflow, and then you're also getting all these metrics about how the different epochs of your uh, deep learning models perform one after each other, how it converged, and, and all these. Okay, and uh, I think we are almost, uh, yeah, we are out of time, but the, the last question, if you can answer uh, very shortly, I find this is a very good question. Uh, what kind of features uh, you are currently missing? What could be an, uh, improved uh, in ML flow? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, actually, there is one feature, we didn't have time to express it, but there is one feature which is very much missing. And uh, that was part of the reason I showed you the ML flow model here in, uh, integrated not on on the mfo server that i shared with you and that is that you cannot log model to remote servers so you need to have your uh your notebooks running on the same computer uh, as mfo if you want to log your models you can still log locally and just or to s3 or azure and just copy it but remote logging i think it's a very very much requested feature <laughs> 